Insurance fraud has hit epidemic levels in the UK. It costs more than £1.3 billion a year. That's nearly £3.6 million a day. Deliberate crashes, bogus personal injuries, even phantom pets. The fraudsters are risking more and more to make a quick killing, and every year it's adding more than £50 to your insurance bill. But insurers are fighting back, exposing just under 15 fake claims every hour, armed with the latest fraud-busting technology. The subject out the vehicle. Including covert surveillance systems, sophisticated data analysis techniques, and specially trained fraud investigators, they're catching these chances red-handed. Instead of getting away with it, more and more of these fraudsters are being caught out and claimed and shamed. Today, an outrageous claimer with expensive taste gets caught out. What was in the bag that you're looking to claim for? He had an Armani suit. Yeah. Oh, Armani shirt. <laughs> black Gucci shoes. <laughs> and my iPad. I think this particular individual is without doubt one of the most persistent and serial fraudsters that we've encountered. A dramatic burglary arouses suspicions. It was like an episode of The Generation Game. And a rotten apple inside the insurance business uses his knowledge to line his pockets. The fraud was that they would uh, essentially invent um, claims which he assigned to himself and then arrange for payments to be made on those fraudulent claims. Jetting away on holiday is fun, but it can be frantic. Once you arrive in the sunshine, you can relax and enjoy yourself, but the journey can present a few challenges. Arriving at a foreign airport, you have to collect your bags and then find your hotel. All this whilst ensuring you leave with the luggage you arrived with. Aviva discovered it wasn't the only company to deal with a man with a taste for travel and a penchant for designer labels. The claim that was presented to us was in the name of Peter Moore, and it was for the loss of an expensive bag and a number of electrical items and devices. He claimed that he had left the bag accidentally in a taxi whilst he was on holiday visiting family. In total, the claim was worth approximately £3,500. We went in the house, we realised we left uh, a hold all, our hold all in the taxi. So you're looking to claim for the items you left behind? Yes, we contacted the police. The police, have, uh, they launched an investigation um, and they told us to um, take this piece of paper to our insurance company in the UK. On the face of it, it did appear to be a genuine claim. Um, the loss was very plausible and um, Mr Moore was very believable and the claim was also supported by invoices and documents. What was in the bag that you're looking to claim for? It was a Gucci holder with wheels, black wheels. He had an Armani suit, yeah. oh, Armani shirt, <laughs> black Gucci shoes, <laughs> uh, my iPad, yeah. a Philips shaver, <laughs> Philips <laughs> toothbrush, <laughs> yeah. and perfume, and my camera. When you say perfume, your perfume, like man's perfume or your wife's perfume? At the toilet, uh, Prada perfume, man. Okay. <laughs> and that's everything of yours that was in Yes. Okay. He had some underwear in there as well. When we investigated the original claim made on a travel insurance policy, we quickly identified that an identical claim for exactly the same things had been made on the same day under a home insurance policy in the same name. Our designer label loving claimant was either being over-efficient or chancing his luck. This was the call he made under his home insurance policy. You've got your personal belonging cover there, and the sums insured for that is £3,500. Thank God for that. When we investigate the claim even further and listen to telephone calls associated to the, to the claims, we quickly found that it was the same person. What I'll do is I'll get this claim registered with you just now. Um, what day did the incident happen, please? On the 22nd, the day we arrived. Oh, gosh, I see. And what's happened? Was it stolen or did you leave it back? No, what actually happened was we had two bags. 
um, and my partner, she had her bag. We got a taxi. We paid the taxi driver already. Mm -hmm. And I got out of the car and they opened the boot and everything. And then we got, where's my... I think I went in to get my charger or something. Yeah. Go, Where's the hold on? And I asked them, and they go, we just got everything out the boot. Mm -hmm. And when you contacted the police, did they give you any reference numbers at all? They gave me, uh, like, a police report. Okay, so they gave me a police report, but there's no numbers on that at all, from what you can see on the report anyway. I haven't got it with me at the no, moment. That, no, that's absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. This polite claimant on the phone was a real pro. As well as making two identical claims to Aviva, we also discovered through the information that's shared between insurers that an identical claim had also been made to the RSA insurance company. When we did speak to the RSA, it was apparent that it was exactly the same claim for exactly the same items with exactly the same documentation again. As a result of further investigations, they were able to identify multiple policies and multiple claims with multiple insurers. He was, in fact, well known to Aviva and had already served a two-year prison sentence for his fraud habit. His conviction in 2012 was as a result of us identifying 20 fraudulent claims with a value of £50,000, all for very similar electrical items and with a very similar MO in as much as they were different names, different addresses and different bank accounts. And it emerged that fraud was a family affair. Whilst he was still under investigation, he took out a further two policies with Aviva in 2015. Um, and as a result of that, two claims were made very shortly afterwards, um, one in the name of his mother and one in the name of his nephew. Those two claims were worth £21,000 and £12,000, respectively. The main protagonist had a number of aliases. The original claim was presented in the name of Peter Moore, but our investigation has also revealed that claims and policies were taken out, not just in his mother and nephew's name, but also Alexis Leon and Alexis Brazil. This man of many characters played a complex game, but the name he was most commonly identified with was Alexis Brazil. These serial claims were very sophisticated. They occurred over a period of time, um, the claims and policies were presented in different names or different addresses, using different bank accounts um, and with different insurers. Brazil may have thought spreading the net wide would make him untraceable, but this naive assumption was his undoing. I think he underestimated in the first place our ability to join the dots up and connect policies and claims, and secondly, the extent to which the industry and insurers shares information uh, between them to fight fraud. Brazil's spree couldn't last forever, and Aviva involved the police. He was finally charged on 17 counts of fraud uh, to the value of £37,000, and he received a two-year custodial sentence. His mother and nephew were also charged and found to be complicit in his fraud, um, and they both received suspended sentences as well. Brazil was a prolific fraudster who'd already done time and just received another sentence behind bars. This would be enough to stop most people, but he had one final brazen claim up his sleeve, this time after the police raid on his home. To illustrate the audacity of this fraud, before he was convicted, he even submitted a claim on his mum's policy for damage caused to the door affecting a forced entry. I think this particular individual is without doubt one of the most persistent and serial fraudsters that we've encountered. This is a good example of insurers' ability to detect fraud, the level to which they're now collaborating to fight fraud and protect innocent customers. The industry is increasingly taking a very tough stance against fraud, um, and it's really important that there are consequences to the fraudsters to deter it in the future. Later, a cheat unwillingly alerts insurers that he's in cahoots with a cohort in a laptop scam. So from the information we were provided with, suggested that the customers were collaborating 
and using the same version of events to potentially make another claim. And too cosy for comfort, scammers creating a £30,000 crash for cash are stalled. They said that this accident happened on the open roads, uh, whereas more likelihood this was staged and done somewhere not to attract attention. No one wants to return home to find thieves have turned their house over. In addition to losing precious items, the knowledge that burglars have rifled through your personal possessions is hugely upsetting. Luckily, break-ins are rare. In England and Wales, 2% of households are burgled each year. Those targeted have to check what's been taken, and it's not easy to spot everything immediately. But as LV discovered with the following case, on occasion, burglaries are certainly not all they appear to be. The customer reported that she'd left her property at 7 a.m. that morning, returned at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and found that her house had been broken into and drawers and wardrobes had been turned out. I came in through the front door. I forgot into the kitchen, I thought, it was cold in here and I turned around and saw that the, um, um, our bifold store uh, window had been smashed. There was glass all over the floor. At that point, obviously, I realised there was something wrong and panicked. Mm -hmm. um, I then went around the house and discovered that they'd, been, they'd ransacked my bedroom, um, the hallway cupboard, uh, the living room, pretty much they'd been through everything. Ms Minkin alleged the items that were stolen included uh, two engagement rings, several designer watches, uh, two expensive cameras, game consoles, two laptops, over £3,000 in bracelets and pendants and her grandma's wedding ring. The thieves had made off with quite a haul. It was like an episode of The Generation Game. In total, this amounted to the value of £20,000. Miss Minkin had called the police about her burglary and LV continued with its usual checks. Um, roughly what was the time that uh, you called them? I phoned my partner and then I phoned the police straight away. Okay. So 20 to 4. LV then instructed a loss adjuster who visited Miss Minkin to take details of the circumstances and go through the list of items stolen and their values. Because of a sort of potential sort of value on the uh, uh, claim, you know, for the sort of items that have been uh, taken, like the jewellery items have got to put on top of that by full cause, what we will um, be best uh, to uh, do is um, get uh, our uh, uh, a loss adjuster appointed on the um, claim. So the uh, loss adjuster will be able to sort of deal with uh, sort of everything for you. And after the visit, the loss adjuster sent in his report and LV was about to settle. We were ready to pay out the claim once we'd received the loss adjuster's report. Uh, and at this stage, we received some intelligence that cast doubt on the amount of the claim. Someone who knew Miss Minkin had given the tip-off, which suggested that some of the items may not have been stolen after all. With the new intelligence, the claim was then referred to a specialist crime prevention team for further investigation. On investigation of the claim, it became apparent that some of the items that had been allegedly stolen um, hadn't been. Um, we also looked into the background and found that Miss Minkin had previously attempted to claim for an engagement ring two years before, which she had lost, but due to the cover on her policy at the time, she wasn't covered for, so no payment was ever made. It was possible that Miss Minkin was trying to compensate for the lost ring in her latest claim. This engagement ring had been included in the loss list that she presented as part of the break-in. The new intelligence and investigations that we carried out really cast doubt on the validity of the claim and how much was being claimed for by Ms Minkin. Time for further investigation. We instructed a claims investigator to visit Ms Minkin at her home address and to put this new evidence to her. We're here in connection with a claim that you made to LV following a theft from this address that occurred on the 11th of November. 
Mm-hmm. The insurance policy um, that was taken out uh, with LV was taken out 10th of December 2016, uh, mm-hmm. 2013, so that would be consistent with when you moved into the property. Yes. So you've put together a, a schedule of loss, so various items on it. So are you happy that that's a true and accurate reflection? As far as I can say, yeah. Um, there, there's actually a couple of other things that I've noticed have gone since. It sounds like Miss Minkin wants to claim for more, but she's challenged about the tip-off, which implied not everything had been taken. Does the claim include items that were not sold? Does not. Did the claim be presented include items that you knew had not been stolen? Miss Minkin alleged that she'd been forced into claiming items by the person who'd given the tip-off. He said claim for everything. He went through stuff and he wanted this. He wanted to claim for the iPads, my MacBook and everything. I said no. But I agreed to some of the stuff. But you knew they hadn't been sold when you claimed for them? The claims inspector put forward the new evidence to Miss Minkin. And when pressed, Miss Minkin accepted and admitted that she had attempted to make a fraudulent claim. So the thieves left behind these items on the side. You recognise you claimed for items that you had not been sold on. Yeah. As the real story emerged, the true cost of the claim dropped. The values actually stolen was more like in the region of £3,000, not £20,000. Miss Minkin didn't come out of the visit from the loss adjuster with a halo on, but this didn't stop her trying to claw back some money for the burglary. Despite Miss Minkin accepting she attempted to make a fraudulent claim, she then phoned the claims department and asked whether we would still pay out part of the claim. We explained that we wouldn't be paying the claim and that we would be cancelling a policy. The company went further, passing the case on to police, and it went all the way to court. At court, Miss Winkin pleaded guilty to one count of fraud by false representation, and she was sentenced to a 12-month community order, 15 days uh, rehabilitation order, and was ordered to pay £1,362 in costs and fines. Whatever her excuses for the bodged claim, they simply hadn't been worth it. Miss Minkin fell into the trap of turning a genuine claim into a money-making scam and has now paid the price. She has a criminal record, her details are on a fraud database, and she's had to pay over £1,000 in fines. This is a great case to show that honesty is the best policy. Making false or exaggerating claims is, isn't worth the risk and the consequences can be really severe. We know that one insurance scam is committed every minute and sadly employees are not always scrupulous. In fact, a member of its own staff has defrauded one in five small businesses. This can be particularly damaging because those on the inside have great familiarity with the way things work and how they can be bypassed. Bigger firms may have more checks in place, but whatever the size of a company, they're all vulnerable. Insurers themselves can be targets. The next case demonstrates how one bad apple in an otherwise good crop can cause serious problems. RSA was the victim in this case, but managed to identify the culprit who was not working alone. This case relates to uh, Kevin Macy, one of our loss adjusters, who uh, used his knowledge of our claims uh, settlement processes to commit a large fraud against us. Mr. Macy uh, and an associate of his, Deborah Starkins, who was not an, an employee of RSA, um, conspired together to um, set up false policies and make false claims um, amounting to a loss to RSA of some £279,000. We're not talking small amounts, and Macy was abusing his position within the firm to make big bucks. Because Macy had uh, a great deal of insider knowledge of RSA's processes and payment systems, 
he was able to manipulate his way around uh, the controls um, in order to avoid uh, detection initially. The fraud was that they would uh, essentially invent um, claims which he assigned to himself and then arrange for payments to be made on those fraudulent claims to uh, a bank account under the control of Starkins. The fraudulent pair worked together against RSA for a substantial period of time. Mr Macy got away with it for uh, over quite a long period of time, but ultimately he was caught by uh, our internal checks and balances, which managed to identify uh, the fraud that uh, he, had, he and Starkings had uh, committed. Um, we put together, after a thorough investigation, uh, a lot of evidence. Control systems at RSA spotted anomalies with Macy's handling of a number of claims. The company found one bank account had received a number of significant payments and it traced names and other claims associated with the account number. Debbie Starkings, who had a policy with RSA, was the one receiving the payments. RSA referred the case to the police, who carried out a full criminal investigation. Financial information was accessed, revealing a pattern in claims that showed, without a doubt, Macy and Starkings were in cahoots. I think as soon as um, Macy was uh, um, arrested, he, he knew the game was up. Uh, we had already carried out a very meticulous investigation, which uh, essentially proved um, beyond doubt that he and Starkins had been in a, a long, uh, dishonest conspiracy together. And both uh, Macy and Starkins were charged with fraud. Their spree was at an end. Both Macy and Starkins appeared at Portsmouth Crown Court, where the weight of evidence against them was extremely strong and they pleaded guilty to the offences as charged. Macy was sentenced to three years and four months imprisonment uh, for a charge of fraud by abuse of position and money laundering. It was quite a long sentence um, for somebody of previous good character, but I think the judge took into account that this was a uh, dire um, breach of, of trust by um, Macy, and that's why he got such a substantial sentence. Starkings was sentenced to two years imprisonment, suspended for two years, and also ordered to do 20 days community service. Financially, both were held to account. Both Macy and Starkins were jointly ordered to repay the £279,000 they stole from RSA, uh, and that um, amount is currently being secured. This scam was spotted and stopped, but the fact it had been committed by a trusted employee was particularly galling. There's no impact in this case on our customers, but of course there is inevitably uh, an impact on RSA employees, um, and we're all bitterly disappointed that one of our colleagues should embark on uh, such a sustained uh, and large uh, act of dishonesty. But the internal systems worked, and hopefully this bad apple is a rarity. As in all cases, there's um, always lessons learnt. It is always a possibility that you will get an employee uh, who will utilise the knowledge they have uh, of our systems and controls to commit uh, dishonesty. It is, gladly, I, I report, extremely rare, uh, but obviously we will have a root cause analysis every time there is any such incident, and um, we have done so on this occasion, and I'm confident that this uh, would never be repeated. I'm sure on reflection, um, as he's sitting in his prison cell, uh, he will think this, this was certainly not something um, he would uh, embark on again.
Still to come, doubts are cast over a head injury when photos don't match up. The shape of the injury of the scar did not appear to match the photograph that we'd received from the claimant solicitors. Although more than half a million frauds are detected each year, some cheats manage to stay under the radar. Insurers use increasingly sophisticated techniques to trip them up, but inevitably, some still slip through the net. What can seem like a small claim may only be the tip of the iceberg. If a scammer is setting his sights on more than one firm, then the damage and costs are multiplied. TCS Claims is used to unravelling complicated cases, and this next example would have tested the patience of a saint. So the customer submitted a claim online. It related to a shopping trip they'd been on. They'd been to London, they'd used the tube, and they'd had their laptop stolen from a rucksack. The value of the claim was £1,200. I went to the shopping search after my friend's house. Yeah. When I checked my MacBook, it was missing. Uh, I thought they might be in my friend house, might be in the shopping area, might be in trains. So I called to my like a friend to uh, did I miss my bag there? They said no. Yeah. But then I went to the train station, the operator gave me a number, they said you need to call and if I find then I will let you know straight away. So of claims of these nature, we would ask the customer to provide us with documentation where we're really trying to look to see if they've got any kind of proof of purchase or proof of ownership, which would allow us to be able to validate the claim. If we needed to ask you for any proof of purchase for the laptop, um, would you be able to provide that? So the box that came in, a receipt, anything at all? Uh, yes, I can. I've got, like, uh, he gave me a, a transfer letter, you know? So he said, this is my name, so I'm going to transfer, if you buy this one, so you need to sign transfer letter. If you need it, then I will send it to you. Oh, OK. And he did, along with an invoice. But had he realised the significance of this vital bit of paper, he may have thought twice. So the customer sent the invoice in to us, and when it arrived, it was actually from one of the suppliers that we actually use. So we actually use them to be able to provide our replacement goods to customers on electrical items. When we received the invoice from the supplier, it wasn't in the name of customer one who had actually submitted the claim. It was actually in the name of customer two, who was a previous customer. It simply wasn't proof of purchase for customer one who was making the claim. Clearly, this was very strange, so the team went back to the claimant to ask why the invoice was in a previous customer's name. Customer explained that they had actually bought the laptop off the previous customer and were willing to provide us with a bank statement confirming the funds had changed. The laptop, when was it you bought it off your friend? In May. In May? Yeah. On the 1st of May, you'd given, me, given us an ownership letter it states that um, Mr. has sold his MacBook Pro to £1,190. So your friend has spent £1,200 on a laptop and then a week later has sold a superior laptop to you for less than he purchased the other one for. That doesn't make much sense, to be honest, that he would lose money and come out of it with a, a sort of a lesser laptop. No, I really don't know. He doesn't appear to know much at all, and none of the documentation he supplied was helping. The customer sent in the bank statements, and there were kind of three fundamental issues with the bank statements that we received. The first one was that the customer said that he purchased this laptop in May, and yet he didn't pay for it until June, which in itself is quite conspicuous. We then checked through the bank statements, and in June, you would expect to see a payment of the £1,200 going out of his account. However, the payment went the other way. So the previous customer actually paid this customer £1,200. Now, we clarified this with the customer, of which he then changed his story and sent us further documentation, which related to a payment going out of his account in April. You've actually provided us with a bank statement that shows you actually bought the laptop a month after you took out the policy. So at the time of the policy inception, there was actually no financial interest in that laptop and you did not own it. I, I don't understand. You can't explain it. 
Yeah, um, you've actually given us a bank statement to show that you paid Mr. £1,200 yeah. on the 23rd of June. Yeah, because because money is not a, because we are just families. We can pay like uh, up to one month or four months. It, it doesn't matter, you know, because we are just a family friend, so, you know. This was a rather unconventional way of doing business, and it raised suspicions with TCS claims. This suggested that between the customer and the previous customer, they were potentially making claims for laptops, switching accounts and amounts between the accounts, and making fraudulent claims. The claimant had helpfully alerted the company to the fact he knew the previous customer listed on the invoice he'd unwittingly supplied. So from the information we were provided with, we could go back and look at the previous customer's claim, and when we did this, the circumstances were almost identical, with the only difference being the mode of public transport that the customer used. This simply suggested that the customers were collaborating and using the same version of events to potentially make another claim. A payout was not an option based on the evidence, which was a bit like quicksand. I've got the MacBook transfer letter in front of me saying I sell for my MacBook Pro to with the amount of £1,100. If okay. that's been created when the incident happened and backdated, we wouldn't actually be able to accept that. And it's not actually signed by either of you, I'm afraid, so it's not a complete document. Uh, my name, I did my sign for there. You can see my sign over there. Um, the one I've got in front of me hasn't actually got any signatures on it at all, I'm afraid. It's just blank. What had been presented was useless. And then there was the issue over payments, or lack of them. The bank statements that you provided us do not show that you paid any money. Um, on the other hand, it does show that he's paid you over £2,700. I don't know because I didn't... Uh... Um, obviously, you must have bought the laptop off your friend. Do you remember when that would have been? Until what month, perhaps? It's May. It's month is May. But you, def I you definitely paid him in May for that laptop. Uh... Yes, that may yeah. or June, may or June. At this stage, we, I do not think we'll be able to accept this claim as the MacBook. It doesn't actually show that you actually own it. At this point in the call, the claimant must have realised he wasn't going to get anywhere. Despite his totally unconvincing story and inadequate documentation, he decided to cut his losses with a very cheeky request to claw back his insurance payments. Could I get my old money refund because because I'm going to cancel this insurance now straight away because I have no insurance right now. I have no laptop right now, sorry. I'm going to cancel it. So could you please transfer my old my money which I already paid about five, six months to you guys every month? What I can do is I can pass it to a cancellation department. They can attempt to look into refunding your premiums for you. However, it is not our fault that we haven't been able to support your claim. The documents you provided aren't sufficient, I'm afraid. We're more than welcome to cover loss and theft of a laptop on this policy. But the documents, as I said, you haven't provided correct documents. Hopefully any ideas he, and possibly his friend, had of trying it on with TCS claims again were nipped in the bud. I believe that based on the evidence that we had, and certainly the bank statements that showed a number of transactions going in and out of the account that potentially these customers would, were looking to make more fraudulent claims. And I wouldn't be surprised if they hadn't made other claims with other insurers. Insurers do share details, so their cards could be marked. It's extremely frustrating that customers would choose to take this course of action. As an insurer, we're always looking to try to pay genuine claims as quickly as possible. But clearly on this occasion and on other occasions, there are customers that are prepared to either make up circumstances or alternatively look to make fraudulent claims. Almost 40 million vehicles are licensed to use the UK's roads. The majority of these are cars and the skills of the drivers behind the wheel vary. Many take pride in their motoring, but there are some who see their cars as a way to make cash. Not all the accidents reported are genuine. Some are staged. In the insurance industry, these are known as crash-for-cash scams. 
They endanger lives and waste the time of those who have to deal with them, like Zurich, which has a radar for the telltale signs of a fake prang. This was a claim made under a personalised motor policy where our insured was allegedly involved in an accident with a third party, so we received notification of that accident claiming personal injury for one person in the car and three other passengers. The suggestion was that this accident had occurred where both vehicles were moving uh, and it was almost a side-on collision where one emerged from a side road into the other vehicle uh, and that's where the injuries were alleged to have occurred. When you consider the personal injuries involved, so there was name driver and three passengers, plus damage to the vehicles and other ancillary aspects, this claim is valued at approximately £30,000. Whiplash injuries were recorded and the costs for this accident were ramping up. We have a number of ways that we determine claims that look more suspicious than others. In this particular case, we had an instance where four people were suggesting that they'd been injured in this collision that didn't seem to be that significant in terms of the impact. So that was something that we were keen to investigate further to establish exactly what had happened. Interestingly, the claims from the three people alleging they were in the car at the time of the crash came in five days after the accident, not straight away. We became suspicious just given the actual number of people who were suggesting that they were injured in what was a relatively minor road traffic accident. And at that point, we widened our investigations to start establishing whether there was any links between the parties and, crucially, what the engineering evidence suggested. The results of the examination of the two cars were extremely revealing. Crucially, in this case, the engineer who inspected the vehicles was of the opinion that these vehicles were stationary when the accident happened. This was a massive contradiction in terms of what was being told by the third party. They said that this accident happened on the open roads, uh, whereas more likelihood this was staged and done somewhere not to attract attention. If the accident had been planned, then there must have been some collusion between those involved to orchestrate it. Next stage of the inquiry was to see whether there were any links between the parties. In other words, whether the third party was in any way known to the named driver. On this case, we were able to identify through some fairly extensive research that the parties definitely knew each other and that was something that they continued to deny. With clear evidence, it was time to ensure the gang didn't get away with its scam and walk off with £30,000. For them to try and obtain that kind of money on the back of an accident that was premeditated and outright fraudulent uh, was ridiculous. The evidence, in our view, was overwhelming. It pointed to a staged accident, and given the strength of that evidence and the amount involved, we referred this case to the police and they carried out their investigations and concluded the same as we did, that this was a staged accident. So the matter was referred for prosecution. In court, the evidence against the gang proved conclusive and Zurich got the outcome it wanted. Our named driver on the policy, Hamad Khan, was sentenced to 10 months in prison, although that was suspended for two years. His colleague in this crime, Amer Narwaz, was sentenced to 14 months in prison, suspended for two years. He was also given a three-month tag and ordered to serve a community service. Any case that involves a prosecution is a satisfactory outcome because it endorses all the hard work that goes into investigating the case. When any crash happens, there will be a trail of evidence and these criminals probably underestimated the extent to which we would scrutinise that. And thankfully we did because that provided us with the best outcome. It's a hardline stance that Zurich believes should have an impact where people are deliberately going out, crashing cars into each other and claiming what in effect at times can be lottery style payments, then we have to have the means in place to stop that. And when we do stop it, then by referring it to the police and having these people prosecuted, then at least we can start using that to act as a deterrent. Many of us live our lives online these days, but it's not just family and friends that can tap into our profile. For insurers, social media is a valuable addition to the toolkit of checks they can make when there are doubts about a claim. If we post our information publicly, then it's fair game. Those sharing information about everyday activities may feel they're making perfectly innocent remarks, but the information we display online can be gold dust. 
As the next case investigated by Aviva highlights, one man must have forgotten his social media was publicly visible. The claimant was a tenant of our insured, who's a housing association in this instance. Um, the claim was for two falls at a private residential property. The uh, claimant stated that the uh, electrics in the bathroom area of the flat hadn't been working. Um, so in the first fall, uh, he'd fallen and gone through a glass pane, suffered a, a laceration to the rear of his head, um, requiring 10 stitches and leaving a scar. The second fall resulted in some relatively minor injuries to his upper body. These sound like nasty accidents, and you would think that after the first, the claimant would have reported the fault. The tenant claimed to have made numerous complaints about the lighting in his flat, but it seems there was some disagreement about this. When we spoke with our customer, the issue with the electrics hadn't been reported to them by the claimant. The claimant provided some photographic evidence of uh, his injury, the, uh, the laceration to the rear of his head. So as part of our own investigations into this matter, we undertook a search of publicly available social media. Um, and we discovered that this claimant was a prolific user of, of social media. We found two things of particular note there. One was that he hadn't, despite being a prolific uh, poster on social media, mentioned at all either of these two falls. And secondly, the fact that he'd posted a picture within the weeks immediately after the uh, first fall um, of a haircut. And on that, we could see the rear of his head. The wound didn't appear as fresh as one might have expected to see from the, given the timeline from the first fall, but also in particular that the shape of the injury, the scar, uh, did not appear to match the photograph that we'd received from the claimant solicitors. This was enough evidence to challenge the validity of the claim. We contacted the claimant's solicitors and asked for the originals of the photographs because we had suspicions that the photograph they'd provided us with may well have been digitally altered. At that point, the claimant uh, discontinued his, his claim. The claimant must have realised his lies were not cutting it. Pleased to say that the claimant hasn't uh, continued to seek to fight this matter. Social media proves to be a fruitful source of uh, finding out things about um, fraudulent claimants. They seem frequently to post things that um, leave themselves exposed. From people chancing their luck by exaggerating their injuries through to organised criminal gangs, insurance fraud hits all of us in the pocket. But instead of getting away with it, more and more of these fraudsters are being caught out and claimed and shamed. Cracking down on more criminals next on BBC One, and there's no expensive suit for one caught red-handed.